Here. Juliana Parks. Here. Pandarina Sumas. Vicki Whitman. Here. And Lisa Wilhite. And then with us today in staff, I know is Amanda Nottingham and Ms. Williamson, also our finance person is here. Um, if we'll go ahead and start, uh, David, if you'll open us with an invocation. Heavenly Father, we'd ask that you guide and bless this charter commission as we go through the steps to try to improve the charter as written. And I would ask that you'd bless the folks that aren't here today that are traveling and, and bless us on our travels home and just continue to bless this wonderful city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Vicki, if you'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I would uh, see that we have a five members that are here, which gives us a uh, uh, majority membership, and we can conduct our meeting. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and see if we can get a motion for the approval of the agenda as presented to us. So noted. <clears throat> Moved by Ms. Whitman. I need a second. I second. Seconded by Ms. Parks. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 A anyone opposed? Hearing no opposition. <coughs> um, I believe that we were all distributed copies of our last minutes, so I would ask that we have approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Get a motion for that. Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Whitman, seconded by? Second. Mr. Johnson. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition, please signify by saying nay. Hearing no opposition, it was approved unanimously. We'll first go to old business uh, I think we went through pretty much all those chapters of 4, 5, and 7 on the 28th. Um, perhaps the one thing that I think we had discussion about really relates to our first view of new business, but was the discussion that was sent to us about the payroll possibility of a change. And uh, I think it was discussed that that was something Mr. Jeter was wanting to look at, the 1st to the 15th of the mayor and the city council. Ms. Williamson, I think you sent us an email message basically sharing some concerns of that. So um, do you want to discuss that? Um, there was nothing done formally. It was just discussed, and we do have Ms. Williamson's recommendations. I would look for a motion at this point, possibly, if you want, or we can just wait to do the standard process. I, there's no motion to change it. If I could just make a, for clarification, okay. I believe the concern from Mr. Jeter was that in Chapter 4, that covers the mayor section, the, um, the increment, like when he is paid, is spelled out, but that does not exist in the council's chapter. And so I don't know if it would be um, just to make sure that it is consistent to add in that they are paid at the same time to put that in the um, council's chapter so that it is clear that has been the practice of the city. And like I said, it is spelled out in, I think, chapter four but not in chapter three. So just for um, unity purpose, that may be rather than changing um, the payroll just to add that in may be a potential um, thing to consider for clarification. Okay, I think that's a recommendation we can make. I will look, uh, Sandra, for you to uh, help us when we get to that point and we can add that in under chapter three if that's okay with everybody and we'll just um, make sure we handle that are there any additional discussions from anyone regarding our discussions at the march 28th meeting regarding chapters four five and seven so Pre preston i would like to say that we do have a revised um, charter which um, richard is basically updating each time we have discussion. Right. So now it'll be the new one. So when we do start to discuss the charter, I think we need to make sure we use 
the chapter number and the um, numbers related instead of page numbers. But I think it's a good process because in the end of our discussion, we will have a complete version that gives us all our discussion points that we made and we can review those in totality. So I think that's a good. Yeah, I think a that's good a very process. good idea because that's what caused some confusion at our last meeting. Yes. Uh, because with all due respect to Mr. Jeter, you know, he was quoting from page 13 and I'm looking as he's reading and I'm on page 18 yeah. and he had the original uh, version. So that would be wonderful. Um, so I guess with that, we can start. Do you want to start? Uh, uh, if there are, let me just make sure there's no additional questions regarding old business under uh, the section one for those chapters. I think we've covered those. And I, I know that we've had some um, issues, but they were settled at the last meeting. And so now I guess we, if there, does anyone have anything else to add? Any members of the public that would like to add anything? All right. Then with that, let's move on to new business and cover um, the chapter six and 16, uh, which are the budget and the finance. Um, Ms. Williamson, we are wanting to keep this as informal as possible. I don't want you to think you're making presentations. We just happen to be sitting up here on the dais. Imagine if this was just a great big circular table. You are equal, if not superior to us as it relates to this, these two sections. <laughs> and I would tell you, there's probably only one or two of us on the board that will probably um, have any qualms or issues uh, regarding discussions of these chapters. But with that, I know that you have probably had an opportunity to look at these sections and you might highlight to us what you'd like to see the Charter Review Commission make changes in. Does yes. that help you? Yes, sir. Uh, so if it's okay, I'll start with the budget section, chapter six. All right. Can, I'm if, not uh, sure if Ms. Williamson has, she, I just gave her a copy of this. I'm not sure if she's um, familiar with the proposed changes that have come from council and mayor. So I don't know if it is better to go through what has been potentially suggested and then get feedback. I'm not sure of the, the best way, but um, I'm just not sure if she has been, if she is aware of all of the um, right. possible changes. Well, do, do you have a copy of, does she have just now a copy one. of it? <laughs> so we can all turn to page 29. And we'll do this again. I want you to understand this is not, a, I keep saying this, but it's not a presentation. I want you to understand we're all talking here and we're going through this and seeing these recommended changes for the first time just as you're seeing them. Yes, sir. So it's not something we've had uh, knowledge of. So uh, the the first suggested change. So, so Preston, go ahead. just, just, go ahead, just from a standpoint of, of me reviewing. So I reviewed with the last one that we had when we left on the last meeting. So Correct. my page would be page 25. Okay. Um, so if we can just go by the section numbers and everything. And I, I, I do have a number of, I think, beginning questions an overall understanding of the structure before we start into the chapter. If I could ask those first, it would help me as we go through it. Okay. So we're going to uh, the Are revision. we on the new, <coughs> the newest one that was just handed out to us? The, the chapter six, 6.01 is where I'm going to start. Okay, so th why don't you get the newest one that I, was just. I do just have it. I just don't have my notes on it. Okay, if you could just sort of flip it to your side, but we're all looking at the new one, okay. which would for us would be, I think, page. Um, it is 29 in the new one. Yes, last, 25 one in the old one. And 25, 25 in, in the uh, old one. Well, 25 is, is in the mayor's section, correct? Or the city council section? No, it's in the budget. Okay, so I'm, on the, the one that was just handed out to us? Mm -hmm. Chapter six. Okay, I just want to make sure. It is confusing. But okay, because I'm, it, make sure, Vicki, I'm looking at the correct so one. So if you're looking says, at, if I'm you're looking at today, if you're looking at today's 
you're on page 29. If Correct. you're looking on the one that we used last week, you're right. on page 25, which is the one I understand your notes are on. Sandra's so. got those notes on page 25. Okay. Yeah. It, just so I can stay as confused as possible with the rest of you, <laughs> I'm going to keep both my 25 and 29 pages open. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. So, um, Sandra, I'm going to ask you, just as Mr. Jeter did, if you'll kind of lead us through these okay. two sections. And Ms. Williamson, Ms. Moorhart, as you may know, is a pretty good at numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not governmental, though, so but, I am all corporate no, I, uh, if finance. We, we should have had her husband here with us to <laughs> help out. He's we probably we the, don't coexist. We, yeah. just, we have to work separately. Yeah. We don't have the same opinions. So go ahead, okay. Sandra. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, from a Chapter 6 overall standpoint, it is about budgeting. So if you could outline the general budgeting process that is currently used if you identify something within that process that you know is not really working right, mm -hmm. we would like to know that. Um, also, uh, what type of budgeting process? So do you do like a zero-based budgeting? Do you do uh, what you spent and received from the prior year with a percent increase? What is the philosophy, basically, of the budgeting process that is currently used, and then any uh, pitfalls that you feel like we have in that process. Yes, ma'am. So we start with our prior year budget and then we make any adjustments. We go back and see if we were off anywhere in, in a significant amount in the prior year and we'll adjust as needed or as we feel is appropriate for the upcoming year. Um, for instance, if we have something that we budgeted too much or too little revenue, we'll adjust it for the next time so we can try to get closer to what the actual is going to be. And um, for the expenditures, um, we'll drop those in, like the finance department, we'll just drop it in, send it to the departments, and they'll adjust it how they need to. And then uh, the department will meet with finance and we'll adjust anything, we'll go over the budget, adjust anything that needs to be adjusted. Then we'll have a meeting, once those meetings are done, we'll have a meeting with the mayor and the CAO to go over the budget. And we'll make any adjustments that come out of those meetings, so we'll have another revision. And then we'll meet with the council members and any revisions they request will be dropped in. Then we'll have a public hearing, or a workshop uh, on, the, on the budget where anyone um, from the public can make comments or ask questions about the budget. Then we'll have a public hearing on the budget and a first reading and a final reading and then the budget will finally be adopted at the second reading. And from a governance standpoint, what is your governing document? So the charter being one and do you um, also use the local government budget? We do. We follow the Local Government Budget Act as well as what's in the charter. Okay, so the state laws are covered, the charter's covered. Yes, ma'am. So we follow both. Right. So what, what part of that budgeting process in the charter um, gives you the most grief or causes the most problems that you would like to see possibly changed as long as it stayed within state law? Um, it, that would be the advertising portion. Um, the Local Government Budget Act doesn't require you to publish the entire budget, but the charter does and it's very hard to um, line up your timing of when it's presented because the charter technically says it has to be advertised as soon as possible after it's introduced to the council. But um, the Bossier Press Tribune only publishes one day a week and the council meeting is on Tuesday and it gets published on Wednesday. So if you've already submitted to the paper, you have to submit it in a week in advance so it would be the prior Wednesday before the meeting ever happened that you would submit to the, the paper. So if anything changed, you don't have a chance to redo your publication. Okay. Okay. And I noticed there were a couple of dates that you were shifting a little bit. To, it, was that to give you a better approach with... To, to give more time to get it done. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So... On the um, budget findings and the variances, do you have any findings within your audit or anything that's out of compliance with that that you are addressing or have addressed? 
Uh, what we'll do is if we do find a 5% variance, we will either, uh, we'll do what's required by the Local Government Budget Act, which is either uh, go ahead and amend the budget or give a notification to the City Council that there is a variance and let them decide if they want to go ahead and leave it as is or do a budget amendment. And you said that was a 5% variance? Yes, ma'am, 5%. And that's just for um, general fund and special revenue funds. And that's in total, right? Yes, ma'am. That's in total. So not Total revenues or total expenditures. Okay. So are there any ordinances that are currently in effect um, that change the Bossier City Charter that you work under? There is um, one concerning dates, and I'm sorry, I did not write down the ordinance number, but it doesn't um, mirror the dates that are in the charter. Okay. Do, you have, do you have that list? Mm -hmm. And I think it has it. Um, I do have it. Find the list. I just looked at it. Long list I've given. Just, I'm trying to get the number so you'll have a. Um, okay. I just hear anything. I know. That's, that's Ms. Williamson, as we get through that, would it be possible to, um, for you to maybe work with uh, Amanda to come up with a recommendation for? language that would help you with the advertising dates, for example, because I would think that if you could put it so that it's a little bit more broad, you know, rather than hit specific dates, if it said something to the language of um, once the council or prior to the council meeting within a two week period, advertising has to occur. You see what I'm saying? If yes, sir. I'm looking at my notes to see uh, my, my language I I wrote down. Um, okay, if you, I mean, I, I, you don't have to find it, but if you find okay. something now that you want, yes. I think if we could get that suggestions from you, we would like to implement those changes. So, so okay. I think Richard has taken her her uh, sheets. Okay, and put them and into put this? Them in here. Okay, good. Yeah, we probably should just let you verify that what was interpreted from the sheet that you gave him is in there correctly, but I believe that's. Excellent. I believe it's in there. It, and so, so from an overall standpoint on section 6.20 budgets, what budgets are covered in this? Why, what types and what budgets um, are covered? Six point two zero. Yes, six. Okay. Uh, section six Oh, 6.02. Okay. Okay, so general fund, um, A is good, um, B, uh, separate special revenue funds. Okay. And then on... What, what is that exactly? Those are if you have um, funds that have revenues that are externally restricted for specific purposes, we have a separate fund on those, and those fall under the Local Government Budget Act. Okay, and that, an example of that would be? So that would be like our, for instance, our um, Community Development Fund, which is the CDBG grant, so it's federal dollars. Would that also include something like the uh, riverboat funding sources? Because uh, I know there are special funds too. Yes, it would be the Riverboat Gaming Trust Fund. And there are several other smaller ones that are that we have. Um, and for um, for uh, letter C, I would suggest um, it, it only mentions the water and sewer fund, but we have additional um, enterprise funds. So I would um, propose changing that to just say enterprise fund budgets because we do um, prepare a budget for all the enterprise funds. And, and so enterprise fund mainly deals with water sewer. What's another example? Uh, of we that? have the public service and sanitation fund okay. and the EMS fund. <coughs> we should just refer to that as a separate enterprise fund. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And 
and then D um, indicates a separate capital fund budget. Yes, I would um, propose to change that to a capital plan as opposed to a capital budget because um, we do not, with the capital plan, we're not appropriating any funds. It's just a, a plan of what is uh, possibly projects to do in the future. Okay, and then E. No, I was going to say, that's covered in E, isn't it? Uh, yeah, in E, a capital plan as herein provided, is there a certain number of years or is there only one? Five, it's a five-year plan. Five-year plan. I'm sorry, I skipped over D. Um, that is uh, capital fund budgets, which we also prepare. So it should say fund and not plan? On, on, on E, she's going uh, not D. I'm sorry, I, sk I totally skipped skip D. D. D got okay. skipped, so she's just going back to D. D are actual budgets but they're annual budgets the the five-year plan in e is a, um, a multi-year okay so what is in the separate capital fund we have one for um, riverboat gaming capital okay. we have a sales tax capital a parkway capital and an ems capital And they're all restricted funds, unrestricted funds? Capital are not restricted, but they are for, they're internally restricted for capital projects. There's no external restrictions. Okay. So if they needed to adjust money from one capital fund to the other, they could? Yes, the council can move. <laughs> Excellent. So on 6.02C, um, at the end of it, in this version, let's see what this version says. That it ends the statement with there from. So to me, that we may need to clarify that. I'm not really sure. Yeah, there, there was a wording after that that said in accordance with the provisions of chapter 20, but I had marked that out. Let me see what chapter 20 said. <clears throat> Okay, chapter 20 only covers um, public utilities, so that part was marked out so it could cover every enterprise fund, not just water and sewer. <clears throat> so should we reword that for clarity, or is it only me that doesn't understand it? You could, you, la could add language that just says to be made there from other enterprise funds. You don't want to be clear with what those funds. Well, again, I think that uh, I'm not sure what what is exactly an enterprise fund and how that de separated is separated from a uh, special revenue fund. So enterprise funds have to be self-sustaining, correct? Like Cor their revenues. Self-sustaining. Yes. Funds. So you could maybe say made made. From, from the budget or something, something like that. Right. And there are they, what's another name? Uh, pr proprietary. Proprietary funds. funds. So enterprise and proprietary have to be self-sustaining with the revenue that they are funds that the city, there is a revenue stream there specifically for that. So as an example of that is the water and sewage fund that we talked about. Yes, sir. That's the biggest one, right? The inter inter yes, that would be the biggest one. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So just to clarify on 6.02 D and C, um, I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding of distinguishing between those two. So the separate capital fund plan is actually a budget. On E. On D. On D. D are the actual budgets, and those are going to be your annual budgets that we do every year. And then on E, it's going to be just a capital plan, not a capital budget. So like a five-year plan. Like a five-year plan, yeah. yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and that capital plan, uh, that five-year capital plan, does it include all capital plans of the city government, or is it specific ones? 
it's, it would be citywide. So I'm, I'm moving on to 6.03. Do we have any other questions on the 6.02 section? Okay, 6.03. So this is the estimate of re receipts and expenditures. You talked a little bit about how your, um, your budget approach with those. When you do your estimates, how, who is involved in the estimation of the receipts and expenses? in an overall, I guess, a leadership role? Um, who is looking at it from a strategic process or looking at it from a headcount standpoint? How do, you, how do you balance that from a leadership role to the, to the actual budget process? So that would be um, a discussion between finance and the mayor's office and CAO to determine um, you know, anything that needs to be estimated. If we need an actuary, we'll get an actuary. We get estimates from, uh, like for example, on our property tax, we'll get an estimate from the tax assessor. We'll just try to find the best source of information to try to get the best estimate we can. Okay. And so you gather that all up and then you you sit down as an executive group and discuss the, the Yes, ma'am, and the mayor will approve if anything needs to be increased or decreased. Okay. And so um, the, in 6.03, when you, this, this portion, let's see, this is one, two, three. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the seventh line you go down to it, it's in red, it says enterprise capital, and it's marked out the utility fund. Yes, ma'am. So um, enterprise is replacing the utility fund because we have more than just the public utilities, and then capital is added because it was not included before. Okay. And, we, and we do annual budgets on our capital funds as well. When you develop your payroll, is it the payroll is a large percent of the expense in each department? Yes, it's probably the, the largest. In most, the largest, yes. In, in what range, 60% of the budget, or do you have an idea about that? Yeah, 50, 60%, yeah. De depending on the department. Mm -hmm. So when you, you all talk about that as a leadership group, do you um, talk about it from a head, head count standpoint? Or do you talk about it both headcount and dollars? And do you look at the staffing? How, how, what's that process? Yes, we look at um, our headcount and how many full-time positions and part-time positions are budgeted. And we budget a salary and benefits for every single approved full-time or part-time equivalent. Okay. And is there an approach to look at it to see if those are all needed or do they need more? How do you? How yes, ma'am. The um, departments will analyze when they get their budget information to start working on their budget. It'll have their um, head counts. They'll get a worksheet that'll say, hey, you have this many people. And the, if they need to adjust it, either add or remove any positions, they will um, request it when they have their budget meeting. And I would say that's also something that is reported monthly with the finance report um, in the Manning, so the, the staffing totals. Um, it doesn't go through each of the departments, but that staffing total is reported um, monthly. So I did find that in one of the, boat, in the minutes, and so that's good. Um, how do you deal with any significant changes within the year? So, so either a department is significantly understaffed and the dollars or positive budget variances? Do you leave those through the year or how do you deal with that? We leave them unless during the year a department goes to the council and requests to either add a position or um, remove a position. And when um, the council approves either adding or removing, then the budget will be adjusted accordingly for that um, specific position that they're um, changing. But we do always budget for fully staffed to, for the department based on that Manning report. 
So, so the budget is is 100% head count for every month, for every day, all of that. So there's no yes, uh, attrition correct. or anything right. budgeted for that. So on this, one of the recommended changes was to mandate a 2% increase for all full-time and part-time city employees. So from from my <coughs> financial standpoint, I would th find that very dangerous to do. Um, just in, it could be, I, I don't know how the government could react fast enough to, um, in case of any kind of geopolitical event or uh, the base has a shutdown or any, anything. I don't, I, that, that probably is the hardest one. I do think people should get raises, so don't get me wrong, but I don't know if our charter should mandate it. And so I think that is a point of discussion that from a commission that we're gonna need to have and have some debate over it. But I would like to do it um, when, when other, our other council, uh, members are here. And I will say that would only apply to um, approximately a third of the employees who are just the municipal because it is already mandated for fire and police to receive that 2%. So this would be approximately 225 or so employees. So um, there is a sales tax dedication for that. That is what um, covers the fire and police. Am I correct, Angela? Yes. Okay. Um, and so that covers those mandated 2% raises for fire and police. So it would be a smaller number, I would say. It's not the entire um, city since those are covered, but so I do understand. So who exactly is not covered under already? It would be what we, we just say are municipal employees. So they, um, are, they contribute to the municipal retirement system, um, MERS system. Um, all of fire contributes to the um, fire pension system and then police to MPERS. And so it's the employees who work in um, the water and sewer, they work in tax, they work in, okay. you know, this municipal complex is kind of how, uh, I think the easiest way to. So they're, they're not already, they don't, they're not already mandated for a raise. They do not have any, there is nothing that, they don't get a, um, an annual okay. increase. All right. So Ms. Nottingham, is you said that the fire and police are covered by the sales tax. Is it sufficient to cover this mandated increase also, or would there need to be another funding source? Um, to cover yeah. all of the employees, would it be enough? No, it would not be enough. Because and I don't think that we could because of the language of that sales tax that did go before the people. Um, I don't know that it, we would be allowed to use that for anything other than fire and police. Right, I think that ad valorem uh, language specifically dedicates it to fire and police. So this so would be an unfunded mandate. It'd be an, it potentially could be an unfunded mandate or something that the mayor might want to look at doing what he's done with the fire and police and come in with a percentage increase that would dedicate that to the annual 2% pay raises for all employees. Maybe something not there. So, so, so as if it stands today, where would that money come from? We would have to at the start um, reallocate some of our sales tax revenue to operating, and it could be a rededication or rededicate or take it to right. take it to a vote and rededicate it. So, so historically, what percent increase has that group of employees received? The fire and police. None of the, the others. 288 or however remember oh, um, the municipal. I think that last time we got one, it was a 2%. And that was in t um, 2021. Yeah, I'm looking. I think I have a list of it. I think they generally have done a 2% if they do anything. So wording such as review for COLA increases as provided by revenue and expense forecast and increased it. Accordingly, feasible. yeah, maybe not put a certain percent or something like that. And that is something that is also part of the salary study that is currently in progress, that they are um, going to provide recommendations on um, increases for employees to catch up. Um, and then 
while it wasn't a 2%, there were two one-time payments that were given, actually a total of three, um, that have been given to employees that are not ongoing, but they were, um, in many cases, for some of the lower wage earners, it was more than what a 2% would be. So they've received three of those. Um, one was this year, 2024, 2023, and 2022, correct? Yes. So. So, so basically not changing their hourly rate or their salary rate, but giving them a bonus in those years, which were mm -hmm. similar to a 2%, but not building upon it, right? Yes, ma'am, okay. just a one-time pay. Yes. Okay. All right, so I would like, Preston, and I think David had a good idea, I would like for this to go on our um, meeting for on the 15th to discuss, just because I think this is a big point in this, and, and we have, in, in my estimation, there could be some exposure for the city. But right. I understand the need for increases too. So let me right, I also think that we need to know what the, um, the salary and wage study is going to tell us because it may make, as I heard you say earlier, it's probably going to make some recommendations themselves on that. Right. So, and, I, and I can give you just um, a quick history. Um, in 2009, uh, prior in the code of ordinances, they did have step increases for different pay, pay classifications or, or different um, job classifications. So in 2009, they had a regular step increase. Then there, there was a freeze on all of that. Um, 2013 was a 2%. 2016 was 2.5%. 2018, 2%. Then in addition in 2018, across the board, $2,400 increase for everyone. And in... April of 2018, an additional um, 2,400. So in 2018, there was a total of $4,800 plus a 2% for all employees. And then in 2021, a 2%. And then we've had the three one-time payments. Just my comment from a, a, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, but basically, what I'm trying to say is the flexibility that you need to be able to take these salary studies and implement them, I think would be impacted if you put something in the charter that made a requirement. So I don't know if this has been an issue at the city, but I know like at, at the parish when we did a salary study, you know, it, while a, some of the jobs got an increase, the study recommended changes to other areas for people who were getting too much money that would actually fund that. And so it didn't require more funding sources, but because we had the flexibility to do that, we were able to make those changes recommended by the study. And if you have something in the charter that says everybody has to get 2%, I mean, what about the people who the study said were already making too much? You're not gonna have that flexibility. So I don't think that we should put something like that in the charter, because I think it kind of binds your hands on that. And I, I do agree. I mean, to me, the charter um, should be the the um, kind of foundational document, but not so restrictive that it not so specific. It, right. You can definitely have unintended consequences when things are enshrined in the charter compared to they can. You know, to me, things like that can be done via ordinance that would still have the effect of law, but not be as restrictive um, for future administrations. And um, I, I definitely see that point. Thank you. Okay. So I'm ready to jump to 6.04 unless anybody else has questions on 6.03. Okay, and so this word may just not be in the world I was in, but um, throughout the 6.04 and a, a couple of other areas, the wording calls several budgets, and, and I don't know if we need to get specific with that instead of several budgets, refer it back to 6.02, which are what budgets are covered in this, um, or if several budgets is a governmental term that I'm just not familiar with. I 
I've not, I'm not familiar with it either, so I think you could word it, how, you know, yeah. if you just want to say, you know, the budget's yeah. per, per 6.02. 6 yeah. Okay, I, I, and there, there are several, um, I'll identify those for Richard so he can um, change those. I think it'll be clear. Yes, ma'am. And then uh, line eight. So we're on 6.04, and if you count down line eight, there's a, um, it says taking into account any estimated accumulated surplus or deficit. <coughs> so would that be the beginning um, equity balances? Yes, ma'am. That would be your beginning fund balance for your governmental funds and your beginning net position for your proprietary funds. Um, it did previously, or it does currently say from the current fiscal year, but I would think you would want your entire accumulated balance rather than just your surplus or deficit from the prior year. Should because we, all that's available to, for use. Yes. Should we call that the beginning balance, equity balance, or should we call it, what, what should we call it instead of a surplus or deficit to be more um, clear about what that means? I think fund balance or net position would be pretty clear. That's how it's labeled in the financial statements. And then, at, uh, let's see, we talked about the several. Um, so in 6.04, um, as I was reading it, and I'm not as familiar with the state laws, and I did try to read a few of them, but it got me more confused than it got me clarity. So, I, I understand um, that. Is currently the way it's written and revised, does it have any state law issues? No, I just had small wording changes on that section. Okay. One of them was, um, I don't know how y'all feel about this, but changing um, where it says bond, just put debt, because we do have some um, various loans. Um, we have more than just bonds. And then it and would give you the flexibility also if you needed to um, have any other, you know, types of funding that aren't bonds. Mm -hmm that if you just put debt, you would be covered. Okay. All right, I'm moving on out of 6.04. Anybody else have questions, comments? Going on to 6.05. And, and so this is around budget reports and amendments. So I um, saw the reporting from monthly to the city council and the head count and all of the financials. Um, and then I just had a question on budget. So if, if there's a, a budget that is exceeding the expenditure or revenues that are exceeding the budget significantly, how are those um, situations dealt with? We will go ahead and uh, if it's um, one that's required to have a budget amendment through the Louisiana Government Budget Act, we'll go ahead and amend it. But if it's one that only requires a notification to the council, we will give the notification to the council and let them decide if they want to leave it as is or go ahead and do an actual amendment. And, and do you track that from a monthly and a year-to-date standpoint, quarterly? What's, what's the reporting um, process? Yes, I do um, uh, monthly budget to actual, and then at the end of the year, we will do a final one, like in December, to see where we're at, and then we'll do one after year-end after all our accruals are posted to see if we need to do an amendment. Okay. So it's really uh, all throughout the year, I guess you'd say. So if there is a department that has major variances, so they've overspent their budget and you can see it before, let's say six month trend, mm -hmm. you see it before the year end is coming. Is there action taken to review it or and hold people accountable? And how is that done? Yes, um, we have a system uh, that does budget checks in the system. So um, say you have an account and you've gone, you've met your budget or gone over budget already and you try to enter a transaction, it will stop you and you have to um, contact purchasing or the finance department to get what's called a budget override. And we can either do that or let them do a um, 
budget transfer and move money from an account they know they're going to have excess in to the account they need money in to let the transaction go through. So um, it's, it's done that way, and also every month the department heads get a budget to actual report, and there's a column that will show you um, you know, at this point in the year, say it's six months, it'll say 50% of your budget is this number, you're at this actual, and it'll give your um, actual percentage, like, if, and you can tell if you're over or under. So one thing I would just say on that, um, when, you know, if they are able to transfer money between line items in their budget, they are, it's never allowed from salaries or benefits, any of that, it is only from um, you know, if they had, um, you know, a line item for subscriptions or for, um, you know, vehicle maintenance, anything like that, they could move potentially if it's evaluated and, and they say we over budgeted here and we're not going to spend all of this on whatever it may be and we need it here. That's something that is evaluated by the finance department on if that, if they can do that. But there are several line items that are restricted that they do not have that ability to um, to move money from. So there's not, uh, I guess, a critical, you know, it would never affect employees, salaries, benefits, anything like that. Yeah, that's a good point. If you want to um, change any salary benefits and anything, you have to go to council. We can't change it within the city. We have to have council approval. So, and that's due to the ordinance, the infamous ordinance that we've heard about, I think. Well, I mean, and that would be under any circumstance, if, if whether that ordinance is in, in place or not, um, the, anytime you're adjusting staffing or salaries, um, if you were to take money from that, it could potentially impact employees in the future, and that would not be something that would be um, able to be done administratively. Um, so it's just within those kind of um, office expense type items. But most of the time you'll see um, a lot of departments will come before the council with uh, an emergency ordinance or they'll come with just an ordinance because something has come up and they recognize that they are, it is going to push them over budget and they'll request um, funding for that so that their overall budget is not, it, this money is, they get it from another source and the council approves it so that it doesn't cause their budgets to go, um, to, to be out of, out of line if it was something that was unforeseen. Okay. So I'm gonna move on from 6.05 to 6.06 .06, unless somebody has other comments or questions. So this is on additional appropriations and budget amendments. So I, um, just need some clarity on line three. So uh, during the course of the year, circumstances may dictate, dictate that additional appropriations or transfers from one line item of appropriation to another um, be made. The director of finance may approve the budget transfers and fund levels. So explain me, kind of guide me through what that would look like. What, what would cause that to happen? And what are the guardrails around transferring between line items? So we could do that in the system, but you you have to take your just those operating accounts, no salary, no insurance, anything like that, and you can transfer between, but you can't go over your original appropriation without going back to council and asking for more money. So that's like what we just talked about, where if your postage, you have excess there, and you need to put it in you know, office um, supplies, then that would be able to be approved by the department, uh, by the director of finance, as long as it doesn't go over, you're not asking for additional money and it's not coming from any of those other restricted areas. So so would that be between departments or would it be mm. department? Uh, within a department. Within the department, okay, gotcha. Okay, and then a little bit further down, it says it's on the second, um, to the last of that paragraph, transfers between line item <coughs> appropriations. So what's the difference? So the other one's line items 
within the department, but is this between different funds? The first one may be talking about like a capital budget. at the fund level. The last one seems like the, the between line items in, within a department. So, so it may be that we need to look at the wording of that paragraph and-, and Make see, it more clear, yeah. yeah. See if we can make it clearer. Okay, 6.06, does anybody have any questions there? We're gonna um, clarify that paragraph. Now we're moving on to, um, well, well, let me back up on that one. So ha has there been any problems, existing problems that you can think of between those transfers and, and has it created any, any angst in the finance area or in the department heads area? I don't think so. I think it works really where, well where they can just see where they're at. Like the departments can look at their transactions and their budget at any time in the system. It's like citywide access for everybody now. So you can see exactly where you're at at any time. And if something comes through and they get stopped, they'll, it'll trigger them to say, hey, we need to um, you know, do a transfer on our budget and they'll just email, us, email it to us. But there are some departments that do have like utilities has water and sewer um, and so I think one of the recommendations was that um, the transfers between lot items and appropriations made upon approval there was a, a mention of um, the director of finance approving budget transfers we had talked about above the fund level for those specifically for those departments where it is there are two separate funds but it is one department so if an expense comes through for uh, if it's in the water department but there's additional money in sewer that has to go uh, if I'm correct that all that has to go before the council now the, there is no flexibility in correct. the um, director of finance approving anything like that and that's not a huge thing most departments do not deal with that but there are some that have multiple funds within their departments that um, I think would it would be um, beneficial if there were some discretion with those specific funds uh, to be able to move within there as long as it's all within that same department if that makes sense okay and it, there's there's wording in the charter that that prevents that yes. or there's wording that doesn't allow it. it correct right now it is not allowed it has to go before the council um, via ordinance and I believe that is in um, I think that's in the section 6.06 .06. So, yeah, it must be made by m amending the respective budgets by ordinance. Yeah, and so that would be the part where if the director of finance had some latitude, if it is within one specific department, but they do have two funds to be able to um, recommend a change that would Possibly not. Possibly a, a dollar threshold maybe. Right, that. sure, something. I mean, definitely with, with some parameters, and um, but... I do think that's one thing that could be um, helpful to some departments. So as you look at that wording, see, see if you can fit something like that in there that we could consider. Okay. And of course the budget variance would still apply if they're, you know, that 5% threshold. So if that's something, you know, that would be um, applicable to this as well. Okay, moving on to 6.07. Um, I don't have anything in that paragraph. But does anyone else have anything? 
<clears throat> we'll move to six um, point. Oh, there, go ahead. I think there there had been, and it's not in here. Um, any portion of an appropriation except an appropriation for capital improvement unexpended and unencumbered at the close will lapse. So currently, if it is in their capital budget, those amounts um, are allowed to roll over if it's a capital project and maybe they didn't get started and it can roll, but anything in their operating expenses. So if they, you know, if a department comes in significantly under budget in one area, they, it's a use it or lose it. And so um, I do think that's something, you know, sometimes I think there's a, that mentality can be yeah. harmful um, if it is, if they know they're going to lose that money, then there is sometimes at the end of the year a race to spend it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, that's, I, I don't know if there's a, a threshold of being allowed to carry over a certain amount um, to the next year. And, and I don't know how... <laughs> She may, she, her director of finance may say, you are going to make my job not so hard. Allow that. Yeah, I would have to check into that and yeah, see if I'm it's allowable. Sure it allow I've never seen an operating one that did. Yeah. All right, 6.08. We're moving on through here, so I'm going to move fast if, unless somebody stops me. I don't have anything on this one either. Um, I don't have any questions, and I don't have any uh, of the changes that cause me questions right in fact <clears throat> I wrote down that the end of that section 6.08 that that was a very good change and then um, 6.09 capital budget plan so I see where um, the word budget was changed to plan so so explain that so this would be our five-year plan that's not an actual budget this is separate and apart from our capital budget that's the plan you were talking about yes ma'am and we could actually add five year because as far as I know it's always will has been and will be a five-year okay. unless you want the flexibility to change the number of years and this we put projects in there that we may have applied for capital outlay through the state um, to risk, you know, to get funding for that or um, certain grants, things like that. That um, that's one of the requirement. That's one of the things that they look at when they are evaluating those projects. Is is it something that is in the city's plan? Um, but we have not uh, designated a funding source or appropriated any money for it. And so I think that came up um, at the last meeting. It was. Um, discussed about um, putting a dollar amount on how much that's going to cost the city or how much more debt but there's really no way to do that because um, like I said these are not plans that they anything would still have to go before the council for approval and an appropriation of the funding but oftentimes those are um, projects that we have sought grant dollars for um, and maybe awaiting an award and we may not get it so they may never never happened but it's uh, kind of part of the vision so on 6.10 um, these are the responsibilities um, and then it's got the publication in an in line item so on a 6.10 a um, the determining the estimated receipts and expenditures so go into that method just a little <coughs> bit more so um, you, you mentioned earlier that you could possibly um, get an actuarial to give you information on property tax, on sales tax. Is that another one that you use? Sales tax, uh, not so much. We, because um, it's it's kind of hard to predict. So we just on sales tax would go uh, kind of historically. Have we been under budget or over budget? Do we have room to increase or do we need to decrease? So that would pretty much go on historical data. Okay. And how, um, how good has the estimations been? We've been pretty pretty good on sales tax. 2% yeah, variance mm -hmm. in budget or? Yeah, we did it 2% this past time, and so far we're, we're on budget for this year. 
And I would say historically that yeah. has been a, it has been a very very conservative, conservative. very okay. conservative on yes. that, so as not to create any budget. Well. And our um, property tax, I'm sorry, our property tax um, estimate is usually very very close. And that's the section where there is an ordinance that um, it's ordinance three of 2015 that changed the, um, it says not later than the 15th of October, um, the ordinance three of 2015 changed it to the 15th of September. And does that work? I would prefer October because I think you have more more data to um, make better budget, um, you know, better prepare for the next year. I think the more data you can collect is um, more helpful. So definitely we'll just leave October here and then con convince the city council that it should be October. Yeah, I think that would that would be our preference to have, um, you know, because otherwise we we tend to start the budget process then, you know, late July, early August is when it starts. The department heads are thinking about it, and you know, you're barely halfway through uh, the year, so. Right. So again, we have in this 6.02b, we've got several budget wording in there, so I think that should should refer back to the 6.02 budgets again. So the, that wording I think needs to be cleared up. And the question is, does the what we currently have in our charter, does it align with the state law and the local government requirements? Uh, what does not align is the advertising. Like for instance, you're not required to advertise the entire budget um, uh, through the Louisiana Government Budget Act. You just have to advertise that you're having a public hearing and that the budget's available if anyone wants to come review it and give the date and time of the. So I kind of tried to word it in line with the Local Government Budget Act, to those requirements to make them a bit closer. And I think that's something too that can be added, you know, that that we follow the local government because <coughs> state law unfortunately does change far more often than the charter changes. And so I think that as long as we may clarify that, you know, we are we are adhering to that state law because we are required to, um, could potentially, you know, that could make sure there's that clear guidance of where anything that may not be specifically outlined in the charter where that guidance is coming from so for clarity purposes we you think we should add to comply with the lgba i think yeah i mean i think you could and in that way as it changes it gives um you know the charter would not have to be updated but it does serve as um the guide for all of our budgeting and to know that we are in compliance with that. All right. Continuing down 6.10C. Uh, so this is all around the power to veto line by line out item. So I'm trying to get this process flow in my mind. So you do the budgets, you've met with the mayor, you've met with the department heads, the council seen it, then you come back and there is there has there been a line item veto? I'm not aware of one. Our knowledge. Is we I've had the same questions um, to clarify does it if if the mayor has line item veto power, if if he were to make a line item veto, does it revert what budget does it go back to? Because he, he can't unilaterally amend it so it would have to I would think go back to the I guess previously adopted or you know I'm because the council can amend it so I don't know if it goes back to the mayor's original budget that's presented I, I agree they're definitely the clarification um, on what that process so looks like it would is that paragraph needed um, I believe in chapter four, 
the mayor is, I'm just going to see if it gave, you know, he, I mean, he has, he has veto power. Um, of the actual expenditure, right, not the budget. <coughs> And that well, and that's kind of where I think there's a little, you know, if he, I would say that the veto, the line item veto in the budget is so that the entire process does not, you know, he he doesn't veto the, it would be all or nothing, if there is no line item power. So I can see that being the impetus for allowing it. However, I don't know what then. The next, you know, what the next step is. Um, obviously, the council can then override the veto with the supermajority. But, um, you know, what I, I really, if that doesn't happen, what is the, what does the budget look like? What's the legal budget then? Yeah. So I, you know, and that's something that. Um, we can do some research and maybe get some more information on other municipalities uh, that may have it. I know, I mean, I believe our governor has line item veto power with the budget with respect to that. So um, I can look through what that process looks like if he does exercise that and then what that next step is. Right. I, <clears throat> but I think it, the governor does have the line item veto and then it does call for the supermajority to override any individual line item veto. Now, whether the legislature, and you're right, I don't know, Amanda, whether or not it comes back and meets to just deal with one mm -hmm. line item or all of them that he line goes and changes. But the governor of Louisiana does have strict line item veto. And I, I mean, I would, as you know, not legal here at all, but I would think that the if he were if the council had amended the budget and that was what the the um, mayor chose to veto was a specific item in there then it would go back to the amount that was in the original budget presented um, that was introduced right unless there's unless it was um, never in the budget to start with in other words, if there was something that was added by the council, mm -hmm. uh, spend ten dollars on this, mm -hmm. right. and he vetoes it, mm -hmm. it would go back to zero. Yeah, if yeah. There were, yeah. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah. If it was ten and he vetoed, it was increased to twenty, and he vetoed the twenty. We go back to the ten. We go back right. to the ten. I agree. Okay. And so is that something you can help us? Sure, with? absolutely. Okay, we'll move on because I think C and D will go together. I think those two will, will come back together. And then uh, E, again, we've got several budgets, so we'll, we'll uh, clear that ter terminology up. And then on the 27th, so the last line of that, it says December 27th. So that still allows for compliance with your, the state laws at the 27th. Yes, ma'am. It has to be before the um, start of the uh, fiscal year. Oh, January 1, basically. Yeah, and December 31st. Some of those, those date adjustments were in multiple sections, but more, I think we had included, um, you had it in, um, like the in section B by the 7th of December instead of the 1st, just to give some latitude for um, Looks when like the yeah, when the advertising and you know holidays and things like that, especially when you get to to those times, and then it was in um, section C. There was no later than the seventeenth of December, and then the twenty seventh of December in sections D and E. Well, should would it help Amanda if it just said instead of the twenty seventh, which I find kind of random, that it just said December thirty first? Because that's the end of the fiscal year. Like this year, it happens to fall on a Tuesday, so the council could meet if they needed. I guess they could meet any day. But since December 31st is the end of the year. I think the 27th, though, um, is potentially to provide for that time for the mayor to veto prior to the new fiscal <laughs> year and allow the council then to um, take action if they so chose to override it. Okay. That makes sense. It would be then, and that's just. I'm not positive, but no, but I mean, yeah, it gives them four days to take action <laughs> mm -hmm. if they need. Twenty seventh is cutting it pretty close. 
It is close. I think you want yeah. to extend mm -hmm. it any further than that. That's a lot of work to do in a short time. Okay, so that is all I had on Chapter 6. And so is there anything that we're missing on Chapter 6 that we need to go back to or look at? Anybody? Mm -mm, I think you did a great job. Thank you, Sandra, okay, for so getting us through So we're going to move on to Chapter 16. This is Department of Finance. Um, and I, I just have an overall general question on it as we begin to, from the organizational structure as we're operating today, um, your responsibilities as Director of Finance, you have the accounting group, yes, the tax, and the purchasing? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then the information system goes to? Information services, unless it's pulled out with right. the change. currently under her. Okay. And um, the tax department. And customer service and customer for service. the utility billing. Okay, and so ARENA, but in the recommendations, the ARENA is going to? The CAO. The CAO, okay, and then the customer service is going to? That's one I think that is definitely something for a, a very fruitful discussion. There are pros and cons, I think, um, in, in both ways. And so I, I, I just I think that's something that was highlighted as a, something for y'all to consider and, and discuss. And Ms. Williamson can certainly give you insight on, on that. And then um, you know, we can, and I'm happy to share anything. Um, you know, if there's, if, uh, if the different perspective, okay. possibly. And so from an accounting standpoint, the accounting department, their major um, task or, or job is, is just pure accounting. Tracking yes, how the money comes in, the money goes out and coding and general ledger, all of that stuff that we, we so love, but not many other people. So. Right, yes okay. ma'am. And then the tax department, so summarize what the tax department does for us. The tax department is um, responsible for collecting uh, sales tax and um, distributing it to the various entities that we collect for. Um, we do, we have occupational license tax, um, business license tax, property tax. They're uh, responsible for all that. Um, they help uh, assist taxpayers when they need help or if they have questions. And, um, and we're the collector for the um, town of Houghton, Plain Dealing, Benton. town of Benton, police jury. There are school board. several. Yeah, the school board, um, a few accounts with the police jury and uh, the sheriff's, sheriff's office. So we collect all and then distribute. And they also are responsible for um, a sales tax audits. And then the purchasing department. They do um, purchasing um, citywide. They assist all the departments with purchasing. Um, yes. Everything um, should run through the, all purchases should run through the purchasing department. And they um, oversee the, the bids, bids and we do State that. bid law compliance. Yes, ma'am. Okay. RFPs, things like that. And then the information services, is it currently under your group? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so if we pulled that out, what, what kind of um, complications or concerns would you have? I don't foresee it really being an issue. Um, I feel like we would still work very closely together because the um, – the enterprise software is it's what we mostly use and it's like probably the largest citywide system we have so we're we're kind of like their largest customers i guess you'd say and then the arena going I, to the cao yeah. is that any concerns I, I feel like everything financial would still come through, like they would send us their financial statements. If they need to purchase anything, they would come to us, but otherwise go to the CAO. It is more as a, a point of contact for like, what's currently under a management, under contract with a management company. But um, regarding they, you know, any building maintenance repairs, we are responsible for any of that. And so it's just more of that coordinating um, because the director of finance does have 
quite a lot um, on her plate and, and under her, and so everything financial does still go through them, but as far as just the reporting and, and kind of keeping up with, um, with any issues or, or things like that, I think it makes sense to go through um, through the CEO. You're really making more of a liaison? Exactly, exactly. It's pretty much split up that way already. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you provide the financial support for it, and yes, you provide basically the operational support. Right, so okay. yes, they reach out if, um, you know, there are any needs, issues, concerns, um, because oftentimes those things with relating to the management company, um, you know, it's something that the council, we want their input on um, if it's a change that is proposed by the management company. So um, kind of goes through the administration uh, and council on, on a lot of those things. But finance will always go through the finance director. And then on the customer service division, explain to us what that division does. So they take care of all of our utility billing and um, meter readings and cut, cut ons and cut offs and um, maintaining all customer accounts for the utilities. And, and is that sewer. financial system within your accounting? Yes, ma'am. It's all connected. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how, why we would move that. So their so. budget is part of that enterprise fund of water and sewer. And so there is... Um, and they do work very well together, but there's, I don't want to say a disconnect, but, but a little bit when they are all housed here, but their expenses on meters and things come out of the utility budget. Um, there's just, like I said, it just seems a little bit of a disconnect, whereas every other utility department employee um, answers to the department head for public utilities, but customer service, she is their department head. I think, I think the question would be, and I, I, I appreciate your clarification, because what we're talking about is customer service as it's related to the utilities, water, sewage, and things Correct. of that nature. Is there a separate area in the city government that handles general customer questions or customer service for just general government issues? Like I call up and say, I have a question about my property tax or my, I'm at a business, I have a question about my sales tax. They usually call the mayor's office, but say, then we refer well, I mean, to I, the appropriate I, department. Right, well, I saw that, I mean, I, I admit today that I, and I won't throw anybody else under the bus, but I went to the other office over here at the Civic Center, and I noticed that the informational number was to the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. So I thought, and, okay. And there's, so that, that kind of customer service really is being pushed and should be, I think, to the public information officer so he can direct it. And I bet you if you look in his description, it says he would help direct And they citizens. may, it may be a wording change on, you know, just the fact that it is called customer service, but it is specific to um, water and you, sewer. Yes, and to like water nature. and sewer. Yes. That's they, why it should be moved to that department. Yeah, they hybrids. also have included in that bill like the sanitation charges on that bill okay. as well and the EMS charge. So is there any concern about funding, blending of funding um, accounts with that? So this is it all standalone and there will not be any transfer of expenses between finance and that? Or is there, and I, I'm not, I'm not versed in all of this fund balances that are set up for each one or accounting, but is there a concern that by moving it, you will have people who used to do their work that you can no longer fund from your budget because the work is now going to be here? Is there any concern of that? Their budget is actually already in with the public utilities budget, so um, they don't use uh, like finance money. Their their um, employees are paid with um, revenues from the water and sewer, so they're like a department within the public utilities department or a division, I guess you'd yeah. say, within the public utilities. But, the answer to but the they're of right. Okay. But right. that does make sense. I mean, because I know that all of us who live here realize that when you get your water and sewage 
budget or bill that there's a list this long before it ever gets to water. Sure. So emergency medical and mm -hmm. sewer and all that. So I think it's important that if they call, they should be calling with questions to the department that it's in rather than going to the finance department. So, so currently, the people that are in the water department and sewage, they're paid out of an enterprise fund? Yes, ma'am. And so if you take away customer service, then what fund pays customer service? It will still be an uh, enterprise fund. They just won't uh, be like just in, in a reporting capacity. Right. So yeah. they're still funded the same the, way? This funding will be the same, yes. Right. It's just a paper change. Uh, it yeah, it's just if, if there's anything um, that needs to go, if you know they need to hire someone then because that division Go, answers to the Department of Finance, then they go to water, the customer service goes to the Department of Finance to make that request rather than going to public utilities. Okay. And so, you know, I, and like I said, I don't think that it's um, a huge issue. I think there is a, it's, there's just a disconnect where this is part of another department and I don't know of any other departments I understand the financial component and why they do um, fall under finance however because it's an enterprise fund and um, all part of public utilities I don't know that we have any other departments like that where a division falls to another department head right that transfer makes sense does. right Okay, 16.02, the Director of Finance. So um, in the qualifications, so in the comparable or, uh, area study and be a CPA, and then the requirement for five years experience, three years, I, I, I'm concerned about deleting that. So I know the, the, in the comment section it says to provide the flexibility in hiring in a broader range of candidates, but the... Um, this is a big deal. I mean, your role is a big deal, and if we were to hire a CPA that just passed the exam with no experience or very little, if we don't put something on that, it could it could be a disastrous thing. And I, I'm not sure if they had maybe trouble finding candidates in the past. And I don't think um, it was necessarily the experience. I think some of it was the supervisory experience because sometimes that is a harder, somebody that has had five years of supervisory experience may be um, in, a, in various departments, you'll see that that is one of the suggested changes. Um, it is hard to find someone. A good example of that is if you probably searched out most tax firms in town who are currently doing taxes for everybody, within those businesses, you have excellent, excellent tax professionals who are probably capable of handling the finance department and the tax operations, but truly they're not supervising anybody. Right. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, but it is very important to be able to deal with people and to, right. to but, manage them. And so you have how many direct reports? 48. Yeah, so if you hired somebody without supervisory experience, and stuck them in that role and said, here, take care of this finance and supervise these 48 people, that could be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think an HR person would recommend removing the supervisory experience or the five years experience. What if you changed it instead of saying three of which is administrative or supervisory position to experience because you, sometimes you're not in that position, but you do that job. Or I mean, they would that make it more flexible? And maybe they had a career change, so they had supervised at a previous, you know, career, right. got into finance, but had did not supervise in as a finance person, right. but, well, or well, had some other kind, like they right. acted as an administrator at their church or some yeah, kind of exactly. volunteer. Juliana, what what if we changed it? And I mean, you're the attorney here, and you can help me a little bit. But maybe if we worded that language to say a combined administrative or financial experience of at least three years. Or for with supervisor, I mean, to have some supervisory experience. Right. Um, 
you know, right. if you don't What would want you think would it. be the minimum of an administrative experience? One year, two years? 46 people is a big group. That's a manage. lot. Three, three years experience. I, I, mean, if, I, would, if you go, I would think minimum of three. If you get very, if you try to make very, ma very many changes there, you're going to find yourself where you're going to be looking and looking and looking and not find that person. I think you have to be really careful with the wording in that. Yeah, you can still, you know, rely on the person doing the hiring to pick the most qualified person, but when you, you just exclude a lot of people when you have it in the charter. Yeah. But, I mean, I think somebody who's got a CPA, if you put three years in financial and three years administrative, you'd be fine. Especially when you're constrained on what you can pay them. <laughs> I mean, what's your view, Ms. Williamson? You think three and three is adequate? I, I, I kind of like the combo idea, like making it a combination of, uh, you know, experience and education or something like that to open it up a little bit. Amanda, I'm open. You want to look yeah, at some I mean, wording? I, I you, think can you two get together and sure. come up with some language on that that helps us get somebody with some experience? Right. I don't think we have to dictate that it has to be five and five, mm -hmm. three and three, but. I think the idea of a combination of at least three years experience in finance and administration would be a good because you're already making him a CPA right so if right. he's a yeah, CPA yeah. and he's yeah. been working over a department yeah he's but, probably and I, but just just know a CPA can uh, they can come out of school and that person could pass the CPA on the first time mm -hmm. and they'd be eligible to be considered right well, so, said, so it I, doesn't mean they have I'm experience make, and it may be I, I mean I, you know if we if we include you know experience in governmental accounting I mean I don't you know I don't know if there are some other ways that we can make sure we um, you know are getting the most qualified candidates but that um, we do have also some flexibility you know because you do you have some and and I you know they're rare but you do have some people that may come right out of school and they're just they're, they're just excellent, and, you know, you don't want to, um, I would hate for us to not be able to pursue right. employing them. Well, I know, like, in the private sector, they'll say, you know, these are the job requirements, but even if you don't meet all those, apply, because you may be the best qualified, and yeah. it's like we could do that here right. on a lower level, but when you have it in the, in the charter, right. you can't hire them. Even if there isn't anybody, that and that's qualifies. what we just would really like to be able to, you know, and and I understand obviously the director of finance, um, you know, that's that's a huge, huge role with a ton of responsibility, um, and I think you'll see as we go through that I think we made suggested changes in all of those so that the I don't want it to sound at all like we are lowering our standards, but that we are able to broaden our um, our net to get candidates because oftentimes you know government work does not pay what the private sector does and so um, if we can get someone that may be willing to take a, a lower salary but they may be a 30-year employee um, so it would just give us a little flexibility in who we can um, at least look at so maybe we can just ask you to look at some language that would talk about a combination of experiences and then that yes, would sir. help us put it and you'd come back with some recommendation of a of term or, or combo because it's a and or combination of three years experience of finance and administration yeah. and if they happen to have had three years of finance and one year of administration we may deem that to be the best candidate so I would caution you to qualify it with governmental experience because okay. that really will narrow your market even okay. more. Okay. And there's so you, a lot of good accountants that, that can adapt sure. to the governmental side of it. So you say you say do not include I, governmental? I, I would not include okay. governmental. You limit. Yeah, and I, I mean I completely understand and, and agree. We want to. Yeah, because that really does narrow that would that really narrow your pool. It, yeah. All right, we're going to go on with 16.02. So on 16.02C, if you will look at that, uh, maintain a record of indebtedness and have charge of the payment and principal and interest on such indebtedness. So um, question there, does it include leases? Yes, ma'am, this would be any long-term debt. Any long-term debt. So 
and is there any approval process or review process that, that happens? On the payment side of it? On um, just the, your record of indebtedness. How do you present that to, to different groups or? No, uh, it's maintained in the accounting department and the comptroller maintains the schedules and when the payments are made, uh, the finance director approves the, the payments. Okay. And, and from a reporting standpoint, from a public reporting standpoint mm -hmm. or a council, um, it, when is that communicated and how is that done? It's included in our annual financials. It's um, included within the financial statements and then um, there's a footnote on, on our debt. Okay, and it does include leases? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. So the, I have a question here and this is, I raised this at the last issue because I didn't really understand it. Um, <clears throat> the term CAFR? Yes, sir. <laughs> it's it's different now. It's ACFR now. Oh, it's now <laughs> AC. Of course, I should have known that. <laughs> ACFR. Yes, sir. It, it, it was raised, if you all remember, by a citizen talking about what is the city's debt. Where would one go with this information on C to know what is the city's current debt level? You know, I mean, because I, I heard there'd be some disagreement between Mr. Ray and the citizen about in where we're at on indebtedness. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a place within the budget that gives the city's overall debt? Is that what C is discussing? Or is yeah. it just talking annually, annual debt? It's in the uh, annual well, report. So I think yeah. C, it, it is her responsibility. C's telling right. us what her responsibility in it is, um, but there's not a lot of reporting requirements around that. Right. We just, um, it's in our annual financials, but we don't um, submit like a monthly report that's like, here's, here's your debt schedule for July or something like that. We, there's no required like monthly type reporting. Okay, any other questions regarding that, uh, Sandra? No. So now I was gonna move to 16.02F. Okay. And, and so um, uh, this develop and administer a uniform central accounting system for all city departments and divisions using generally accepted accounting principles and governmental accounting standard boards. So I have all of that, and then we're taking out the purchasing. Is that because we're moving the purchasing to the it purchasing will, yes, area? Yes, ma'am. It will be in the purchasing section. Okay. And then um, so the ACFR is not mentioned there at all. Is that going to be mentioned in a reporting it's, section? If you look at the um, section 3.10 independent audit, what's published from that is our ACFR along with all our reports of our results, the auditor's results. So it's a, a big reporting package that we submit to the legislative auditor. So I did look at it and we currently have 2022 that's available for the public. And so 2023 will come out, when's the expected time frame? Uh, July 1st. July 1st. And that's our, that is state law that requires right. it be, I think our deadline is, is it? <coughs> July 1st. So that was one of our changes on 3.10 was to be six months after the end of the fiscal year because the wording was a little, like not clear on that. Yep but um, we do have six months to get that completed and submitted. So, so is there an interim report? Um, that just, just our monthly financials. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna continue on. Um, Excuse me, 16. Oh, point oh, 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 the, has a question. The monthly financial, is it, is it given to the city council? Yes, ma'am. Each month? So yes, ma'am. Ma we do it monthly. Okay. It so I did find it in in the minutes mm -hmm. on the website. I did find it there a couple of different months. Um, and so, usually and you'll see it in the, um, is it the second um, meeting after the? the yeah, usually the second meeting. Um, and it, if you uh, look and at you the agenda, it. there's like a, a link and you, you click that link and it'll like take you to the actual yeah. It is in the agenda document. packet. Yeah. 
With headcount, I saw. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. So it's a pretty comprehensive package. Um, it's very financially worded, you know, okay. but that's what it has to be to <laughs> meet all the requirements, right? Okay, so um, 16.02 I, no, wait, F, no, I, I, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I. So maintain an inventory of all city property, real and uh, personal. So um, it, tell me a little bit about the inventory. Is there a threshold? I mean, are we inventorying everything $1,000 in value above, or how, do, how does that work? For our capital assets, we do everything 5000 and above with a useful life of more than one year. And then we also have another uh, non-capital inventory listing, and it's anything that you want to track, like um, say you have tablets or computers or something like that that are not necessarily $5,000, but you you would want to keep track of them, and we'll put like a, a blue tag on them, and we keep a list of those as well. Okay. Is there any review by the mayor or the council with that? No. Um, those go to the department heads to do an inventory and they let us know if um, you know anything's missing or you know did they dispose of anything do, that we need to take off the list so it's really between accounting and the departments and we did have a discussion as we transitioned to the new software system and in inventory i mean inventory pages used to be uh, it would be 30 or 40 pages for a department and there were things that some you know 1983 yeah, yeah it was a, a ballpoint pen from <laughs> so we did have some discussions with um the director of finance over establishing thresholds but it being an administrative um decision rather than yeah. being something put in the charter so we've kind of gone i mean as as things change as you know if you put a dollar amount that's that's very different than what a dollar amount may have been a couple of years ago for the same item and so um, we kind of went um, with her recommendations and guidance on best practices and, and how it's done in, in other, other places. And should there be a um, review process? A, a continual Annually review they process? review the inventory and update. Okay. So each department does and then they can say, you know, if something is broken or, but it, it's not something that uh, you'll see uh, ordinances for vehicles that are declared surplus so that we can then send them to auction. Those were purchased with the capital funds. Obviously, they are the larger items. Um, but, you know, a, a computer printer that was, you know, $75 if it was bought out of just our office supply money doesn't necessarily get an inventory tag and get tracked. Um, and it doesn't have to come back to be declared surplus. I mean, sometimes, you know, those things, we wanted to be practical where things like that break or, you know, you, you may have an issue just that's not, um, it's just a day-to-day, -day, I guess, um, office expense more than a capital. So have there been any major write-offs? Like large items or groups of smaller items? Large items, no, if anything, it's been things that needed to be added. Because we have to gather from all, like we have to get our infrastructure from engineering and our projects from various departments to see where they're at to know if they're, if they're completed or are they still in progress. And so they keep us up to date on all of that information. So, I mean, our inventory, and, and now I'm speaking more to the, I guess, um, office related more capital expenses and inventory items but we do have to keep I mean our you know feet of water line and sewer line and fire hydrants and all of that is is also part of it and that that we don't um, that that is not subject to you know kind of a just discussion I mean that that is in that's all accounted for and updated as if the water lines abandoned or anything like that, but that's not something that is um, subject to change where we don't account for it, you know. Okay. 16.02J, okay. uh, so this is investing idle city funds. 
It says including outside management services. What is that? So we have a um, invest investment firm that helps us um, invest funds and we uh, let them manage our investments. So, so it's not their funds, so, it's, so it's, we're investing all idle city funds as permitted by law using an outside management firm? Yes. Allowing for that contract service. Okay. So just take out the word by, including use of. It's a good way to do it. Yeah. Where it just says permitted by law, including use of outside management services. Okay. Then that makes sure everybody's. Yeah. That way it's not their funds, it's our funds, but we're just using them to help manage it. Okay, I'm going to move on to 16.03 unless anybody has questions. So this is on the purchasing agent. Um, so just a question there. Are, are you seeing any um, purchasing uh, workarounds? So they would work around the need for a purchase of a, um, following a bid law but in splitting whatever they are purchasing, any kind of workarounds that need to be addressed and the controls need to be tightened? Um, no, how, how we catch that is everything that is um, entered as a requisition in, this, in the system goes um, directly to the purchasing department, so they will notice if you didn't get your quotes or you it's something you were supposed to bid and you didn't go out to bid, so they can kick it back and say, hey, you need to follow you know this procedure, this procedure. So we do have a way to catch that so nothing is slipping through and she's good about catching it too the breaking down like into into separate items and said when it's really something that should be bid she's re really good about catching that and then all of that documentation if they did have to get quotes is all uploaded into the system so as the backup um, evidence and documentation for um, if when those things are approved and after it gets through purchasing, then it um, there's, of course, the department approval. Then we have a finance approval. And, and if it's a project, we have a mayor's office approval. So there are several levels of approvals. Okay. And then um, it, it talks about the purchasing agent, and they're an unclassified employee. There are no job requirements listed on that person. And just a question, should we have it consistent with putting the top line requirements like we did the director of finance or no and that's just a question for the commission members it is inconsistent just trying to figure out if we we do needs. have a job because it's not a department head we we don't have um like for division managers within departments we don't have requirements because those do not require council approval but we do have job descriptions that um, HR maintains and each department maintains so they can be because sometimes it may be somebody within that may not have um, you know they may, there may be certain pieces of that that they might not meet but they've got the experience and they've worked under um, the department already um, so those do not, we don't have those specific in charter because they don't require council approval for division heads. So that's the, that's the designation within the charter. If it's not council approval, then the job requirements are handled in the HR. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, so num I'll go on to 16.03A, um, and this is the supervision of the operation of storerooms and warehouses. So should there be something in there in a uh, reporting of significant losses? So it's 16.03A. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking. I thought we um, changed something about that one because we're not really doing the centralized warehouse anymore. You're not doing a centralized warehouse anymore? 
the departments probably do that. The themselves. departments, mm -hmm. some of the of our departments have a warehouse that they manage, but our purchasing department does not manage it for them. We used to have a central warehouse where we did like um, office supplies and things like that, and they would come pick them up and we check them out and, and uh, you know charge the departments, but we don't do it like that anymore. They pretty much do their own ordering. But like Public Utilities has a warehouse where they keep um, you know different uh, items needed for various repairs throughout the utility system. They maintain, um, and we have we are in the process of rolling out um, an asset management portion of the software that helps maintain those inventories um, once all those items are entered. And so we're doing that with each department. Um, so they do maintain, you know, engineering has huh. drones or they have different equipment. And, um, and I think that was referring, this was, it just kind of shows the, the dating of it, um, where you used to go to the Department of Finance and say, hey, I need a roll of paper towels. And you would sign it out. And so they ordered and kept in an area for everybody to go and get. Now we've just put it in each department's budget where they're responsible for ordering the supplies within their office. So we you may be okay to just take that out. So should, yeah. Can we just okay. delete? Look at I, the I would think it would be best a. to just delete yeah. it so it won't yeah, be Yeah, because I do confusing. think there's some confusion with yeah. that. Okay, we can do that. All right, so. The investment fund company you talked about a few moments ago, I'm not sure who that is and, and how were they selected? We use um, Sisong in Baton Rouge. Um, as far as how they were selected, they've been using them since before I was here, so I'm not sure. But it, is um, a pre it does go before council for yeah. approval. Okay, okay. I would think like a RFP or something like yeah. that. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to 16.03. Um, One. 16.031, so this is the competitive bidding uh, section. So my first question is, as written, does it follow the state bid laws? I was, to be honest, a bit confused on the wording, so we did. <laughs> well, I'm we glad did, you were, because I was too. <laughs> we did some, cha some um, changes on the wording here. Um, like, for example, um, uh, before making a purchase or public works contract, the purchasing agent shall give opportunity for competitive bidding as prescribed by, and we put purchasing policies and procedures there because there is actually a pro procurement code, but we use um, the bid law. We don't use the state procurement code, so I thought that was a little confusing, so we changed that there. Um, not in conflict with applicable laws of the state and, cod and uh, codified in the Code of Ordinance for the Bossier of, uh, City of Bossier City, all purchases made, it says sales, I'm not sure, we changed that to purchases, made by the purchasing agent shall be on the basis of competitive bids after such public notice as may be prescribed by, we put state law there, instead of by City Council Ordinance and all purchases instead of sales there shall be to awarded to the lowest responsible bidder, not the highest. Um, and the rest we left the same. Okay. And so from the way it's written with those changes, you feel good that it follows the state bid laws and yes, that the controls are tied enough? Yeah, I, I hope it's more clear the way we okay. rewrote. The procurement code refers to how state agencies Yes, there is a state procurement code that you can elect to follow if right. you want to, but we have it not made that election. So it just would clarify. Mm -hmm. okay. What, kind of going back to something we talked about earlier, what about where it says on the third line, not in conflict with applicable laws of the state codified in the code of ordinances for the city of Bossier. So that makes it sound like the state laws are codified in the code of ordinances but what if the state law changes, but the code of ordinance doesn't change? Does it, is that, should that be not in conflict with applicable state laws and as codified in the code of ordinances? We have worked to update as we've changed ordinances um, to um, when the ordinance reflect, if it is, we're following a state law, then if the state law changes, our ordinance is worded in such a way that it 
it's updated as well. Like okay. we don't have to go back and amend the ordinance every time a state law changes, that it reflects that change automatically, I guess, if it's a um, section of law that we follow okay. like this. Okay, um, any other questions on the 16.03.1? So we'll move on to 16.032. Um, as I look at that, um, what came to my mind, is there a chart of authority by dollar threshold? So approvals by different levels, or is it? No, I don't, I didn't note anything about a dollar threshold here. Um, we just said requisition to be approved by the head of the department or their designee. So it's um, from zero to 10 million? To, to yes, yes, Every, everything gets approved. But can they, what, w would there be more than one approval needed after Two million or three million or four million. What what would be the threshold? Uh, five hundred dollars. That where it gets into multiple levels of approval is five hundred dollars. So after five hundred, then it goes to. It'll go to um, if it's a check request, it will go to finance. Um, if it's a requisition, it goes instead of like a. Uh, it will go to the head of purchasing instead of like just a purchasing agent. And state law dictates the threshold for certain purchases on um, dollar amounts, what's considered a or, small purchase or a... Oh, yes, we do. Yes, there is uh, levels that are published in the state bid law. And that changes. I think they just increased it within the last two years. So um, I can't remember if they maybe doubled from 30000 to 60000 60 is 60 yeah. now for materials and supplies. So yeah. we do follow those as far as do you need a bid or can you get quotes or what's kind of what's the process we'll follow what the process is in the bid law so do we need a statement in there um, stating that we're going to follow the state bid laws and their thresholds uh, i thought that was it's kind of somewhat covered in 16.031 well that may be just the bidding part of it. That may be just one that we need to look Maybe at. Maybe add another section or something for if it's in between, you know, not not large enough to be a bid, but you do have to do some kind of procedures on it. Okay. Yeah, just maybe language that says follows applicable state laws. And then uh, the only questions I had after that on 16.04 and 16.05 was whether we needed anything on um, the comptroller and then the director of, or the tax administrator. But those positions are not approved by the city council, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so they're hired by you or? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and so we don't have the job descriptions, but you have job descriptions from the HR that you'll follow? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So I've got that. Then um, uh, the customer service division, that's going to CAO for uh, direct, no? no that's water the public and sewer. utilities. That's public water and sewer. So oh, like yeah. said, that was, um, you know, we had some discussion. I think that's yeah. one to uh, we okay. covered ponder that. more. Uh, uh, okay. And then 16.07 is going to go to the new Department of Informational Services, and then the Arena Division go to the CAO. The CAO. Okay. And, right. you know, as far as title of, of that, if it's created a, a new department, I don't know if Information Services reflects or encompasses, you know, or is the maybe. best title, I guess, maybe. maybe. Yeah, I was thinking maybe like Information Technology. Technology, yeah. Because they do more than just the software piece of right. it. Yeah. Okay. So that's all the questions I had noted. Is there anybody else that has comments or questions? I have a question. So, like, when you give the police department their budget, or and I'm just using them for instance, the fire department their budget, marshal's office their budget, 
So let's, let's say, is there ever an instance where those departments pay for something out of their department for another department? Generally, no. Um, maybe there's been a little bit between like police and fire but if they share a resource like maybe one will pay for half and the other will pay for half mm -hmm. but they get both to use the asset okay and like information services um all of the cell phone bills come in the information services receives those and then they allocate to the different departments so i mean you have situations like that but it does um, so they are able, there are a couple of departments like fleet services that are able to charge another account, but it is only for those goods or, um, you know, services that are used by that department. So if, um, if, you know, a department head has a, a vehicle and they have to, you know, get a new tire, then fleet services handles that and they charge that to the vehicle maintenance for that specific department. So we try to keep it everything allocated where it needs mm -hmm. to be who's actually getting the the service or the product and we've talked about doing that in different ways where fleet services just handles that their budget reflects that and take that from each um, department and and there's pros and cons to to both I think all right any other general questions um, when David. we were talking about the department entities and their budgets, uh, the use it or lose it, I'd like to see if we could put that on the, our workshop and just get into that a little deeper. Yeah, I, I understand because that issue is how often does it come? Maybe if there's a certain percentage that's reached that you just don't, if you're at 10 percent, you just can't go in and start spending money to try to just make sure you don't. You know, that's the type of thing we'd have to the, look at. The GSA that came out in the government, you know, they're, they're year ending September 30 and October 1. There's a lot of fruit Feds do that, all that the, the time, taxpayers yeah. spend on their level. I'd just like to find out a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, and I certainly I don't want, want to imply. to lose money. Right. But yeah, I don't want to imply frivolous spending, but I think there is a race to try to project, okay, we can order this. That will cover us for next year for the, you know, just that right. so that. The departments can um, they by that point, you know, things get crazy sometimes, and they may just realize, wait a minute, you know. But it would just give them a little flexibility if it's possible to do that, um, to be good stewards during the year, and and then um, give a little cushion yeah. that next year. C capture something that's that's still there for the rainy day when something sure. does creep sure. up yes. on us, <laughs> and it's not an emergency. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so an option for that, because I don't think the financial laws and reporting will allow for that to carry over, but the option is when they're doing their budget for the next year, for those who have done that, yeah, to make that. sure that things are covered uh, well for them. Because what happens is, and even in corporate America, um, you don't spend your budget, so they want to claw that back from you. Right and you still may need it next year. Yeah. So how is it that you, you keep that uh, budget intact, but right. you don't spend, uh, because you don't, you don't need it right them now? For, for being good stewards. Yeah, and, yeah you don't want to give them a penalty, yeah. The, 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 the municipalities that are out there, and they're, they're, they are good stewards of the money. If, you know, if they're consistently being good right. stewards of the money, there's something left there, and something does really big pop up if it's at least noted and accounted for, you know, hey, I've got I'm, I've got to exceed this big time this month, but three years I've been under, and yeah. just mm -hmm. something to. Okay. And uh, all the departments, a lot of the departments are within the general fund, and um, on the variance, we look at general fund as a whole. Okay. So if one department's way over and one department's way under, it's you're not going to get a five percent overall. And we understand, and it's hard to know in July what you know what you're going to need for all of next year when you haven't even spent all your money for this year. So we we try to work with the departments as much as we can on on the budget. And I, from the administration, would like to give a tremendous thanks and appreciation for everyone in our finance department. They do a phenomenal job, and they manage a lot they wear a lot of different hats and they are wonderful and so accommodating 
great to work with, and um, and we have absolutely. I mean, the integrity is it's unmatched, and so um, we have no no concerns that um, they're going to keep us in line for sure. So I appreciate them. I want to say that. Thank you and for answering the questions and being here. We really appreciate Thank you. it. No problem. Thank you. Great insight. Thank All you. All right. Let me make a, a couple yeah. comments, and then we can get on with our. Uh, business number one is Sandra Moore. Thank you. Um, exceptional job. Exceptional job, and I appreciate the fact that you've taken time to go through that and help us as a commission. Uh, also, Amanda, I I want to just second Miss Williamson how much we appreciate you, the suggestions you've made, your coming and helping us, and I attend a lot of city council meetings, and I can tell you that there's a lot of acrimony sometimes but I've never seen anyone show you any amount of disrespect so you uh, are doing evidently a phenomenal job I don't know how she's a unicorn I, was gonna say, <laughs> I don't know how you do what you're doing um, let me go to new, the other new business which is I think we're going to probably continue discussions of our future chapters at our next meeting on the 15th at 6 o'clock. So uh, it's a, a, it is a working session. Workshop. 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 Right. And it'll be at 6 o'clock. We're going to meet over in the Civic Center and try to keep it as comfortable and casual as possible. Um, I don't know how many viewers we have watching our show this morning outside of my wife, Debbie, and my grandson, Kane. I don't know if you told your family members to watch. It is Debbie. posted so they can go back later. Oh, well, hopefully David's family will watch later. What a great job he's done. My family's watching the eclipse. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I forgot On this that. cloudy day, let's hope it clears up. Um, Amanda, anything from you or Richard? Um, I appreciate the job you guys are doing to help us. When you're not here, he's here. And when he's not here, you're here. And we couldn't do Team this. Team effort, for sure. We thank y'all very no, much. We really appreciate the job. I appreciate the job of all our commissioners. Um, sometimes we get a little acrimonious, but on the most part, we've kept it very professional. And I do appreciate that very much of the job you're doing. With that, if there's no further business, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Second. So moved by Mr. Johnson, seconded by Ms. Par I'll Ms. second it. By uh, Ms. Moorhart. All those that want to stay, stay. If not, we are now adjourned. Exactly where are we going to meet?